I'm ready. You're ready? Okay, I am so honored and thrilled to have my guest here today, Mark Breslin, Toronto comedy, Canadian comedy legend, Canadian comedy legend in general, needs not to be bound by Canada. How are you today? I'm fine. You're, uh, you've obviously lowered your standards, so thank you. I've lowered my standards of what? I well, thought you were going to say you lowered your standards. No, no, you've lowered your standards. That's the joke. So you said how great I was, and I said, uh, uh, you've lowered your standards, clearly. Okay, I have kind of like a short-term memory right. situation, okay, so I kind no of problem. forgot what I said before that. Um, okay, so Mark Breslin, I read your uh, your wonderful book, Control Freaked, your autobiography, memoir, whatever you want to call it, from 2002. Learned a lot about your life. Um, I guess let's start with like the basic stuff that everybody wants to hear. Tell sure. us about Jim Carrey, Howie Mandel, Norm MacDonald, all your stories. Okay, well, um, maybe you want to ask a more targeted question on that. Okay, sure. Maybe like how I started in the business, that kind of stuff. That's true, because I, for me, I know so well now. I've listened to you on every single podcast there right. is. I'm kind of new to this podcasting okay. thing. Yeah, that's right. fine. Um, okay, tell us how you started in the biz. Well, I never What's intended to get into the business that I got into, and I never even intended to become a comic. It all happened organically. Um, like almost everybody I know... Um, I was interested in comedy and loved to watch sitcoms when I was a kid. I had a subscription to Mad Magazine when I was eight, courtesy of my cousin Victor, which was terrific. Um, I would, when I was in high school and university, I would go sit in Gary Geller's basement and listen to, uh, you know, Richard Pryor albums and Mort Saul albums and Lenny Bruce albums, just like everybody else. But it never, ever occurred to me that I might want to actually do this. Totally. Probably because there really wasn't any kind of an infrastructure at the time. So it never occurred to me. What I thought I would do is... Oh, I got my degree in English literature, and I thought maybe I'd write the great Canadian novel. Well, except maybe you did. Well, my I opinion. think Mordecai Richler beat me to it. Um, or I would do something like I'd get a job in advertising because I'm really good at spin. And you're Jewish. And I'm Jewish and all, all that sort of stuff. Maybe I would teach. I really had no plan. And in the 70s, you didn't need a plan. And most people didn't have a plan. It kills me every time I get hit by the reverse inflation of like seeing how much everything costed just in 2000, not in just in 2002, but then in your memory of the 70s well, and 80s. Well, you made less, everything cost less, but that wasn't it. The, the it was success that we are obsessed with today um, wasn't as important then. It was all about finding your truth and finding what you really wanted to do in life. And so many people, including myself, um, thought, well, I could be a lawyer because I'm good with words and I was, pretty good, I was a pretty good student, but I don't want to sit at a desk all day, so I'll do what I want to do. But that's not so true anymore. I listened to my son's uh, you know, older brothers uh, friends, older brothers, and they all talk about this, you know, these business plans that they have. Everybody wants to make money now. It wasn't that, it, that was not true in 1974. You just did what you loved. So when I graduated, I had no, I had no idea what I would do. Most of my friends uh, went to do graduate work. I just didn't want to go to school yet again another year. But I got a job that summer um, as one of the initial hosts, greeters at Harborfront. It was the first year. And as a result, um, I saw a lot of bands and I saw a lot of uh, theater companies that they would book. And I was always very honest. And I was also a person who went out every night of the week because I always loved public performance. And they would ask me, so what did you think of the band we had last night? And I would say, they were crap. If you want a really good band, you should book this band. And they would go, Okay, because they were all guys in their 50s. They didn't know. And at the end of the, the summer, not knowing what I was going to do the next day, they said, why don't you just stay and help us start programming for next summer? I did. And it became a full-time job. And I met comics. And I'd never met comics before. And I thought, wow, these are really interesting people. How old were you at this point in time? 22. Two. Okay, go on. Yeah, 22. Anyway, um, I started uh, comedy night. I started booking comics. I started emceeing the shows. I found that I had a taste for doing comedy myself. Um, I was very influenced at the time by punk 
and by a lot of radical politics that I was involved in and had been involved in for quite a while. And this was the kind of comedy that was being done for the very first time in Canada. It was being done in the States 10 years earlier, but not here. So it wasn't like these people could just go get booked in some restaurant somewhere. There were places like that. There was a place down on Young Street called Jeans Taylor's Improv, and it was white linen tablecloths and waiters dressed in tuxedos. And if the comics swore, you'd never come back. If the comics made fun of the government, you'd never come back. If the comics talked about sex, you'd never come back. Well, that was completely, you know, against everything that I believed. You know, when I was at that age, I used to go over to my friend's parents for a Friday night dinner. And I would do my, you know, wild riffs at the dinner table. And my friend's mother would always say, Mark, 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 some things we just don't talk about at the dinner table. And I realized that those were the only things I wanted to talk about and the only things I was interested in having other people talk about. Um, I was the most sober one of the group of all of these comics. So they sort of leaned on me for, you know, where, we, where do we go next with this? Uh, nobody even thought of it as a business, but where can we keep performing? And then the axe fell, and they canceled all the Harborfront programs, and no one had any place to play. My friend was operating a folk night at um, 519 Church Street Community Center. So I went to him and I said, do you ever think about putting some comics on? He went, hey, that's a great idea. Bring them down. I did. I called my friends. They came down. They went on in between the, the folkies, and it was a disaster. Just a disaster, because the folkies were positive and uh, <laughs> idealistic and they you know ha wore patchouli oil people still haven't given up on that format by the way and it's never worked it since. just doesn't it's work so, and the comics were all chain smoking at the back because you could yeah. do that and then wore black wow. and swearing and kind of muttering underneath their breath so obviously that wasn't going to work and then i had the best and simplest idea i've ever had i went to the board of the community center and said i'd like to do a comedy night here and they said, well, how's Wednesday? Wednesday's the worst night for show business. And I said, done. I said, but we have to charge you. I went, how much? They said, $38 for the room rental every week. <gasps> Where am I going to get $38? And then I thought, wait, I could charge for this. A dollar. The room holds 100 people. I'll pay the comic half of it. And then I'll rent the other... Uh, part for thirty-eight dollars. I'll have about twelve dollars left over. I can actually like take a girl out for coffee afterwards. Hey, this is great. Meanwhile, I was on unemployment insurance, so you know I was making money that way, and I was somehow surviving. One thing led to another, and nine weeks later, uh, I got a call from a guy at the Globe and Mail. Jack Capizza was his name. And Jack Pizza said to me, um, hey, I Sounds hear you real. do. Sorry, what? Sounds real. Yep, it's real. Uh, everything I will say. No, I believe you. It is just real. sounds fake, which is funny, but go on. Sorry. Um, I think he's the religion editor of the of the Globe now, if he's still working Jack there. Jack Pizza? Cup Pizza. Oh, Cup Pizza. Yeah, K A P I C A. Oh, okay. That's fine with me. I think it's a Polish name. Anyway. Um, he said, look, I hear you're doing something really interesting down at, uh, you know, the 519 Community Center. Can I show up and maybe I can write a piece about it? I said, yeah, sure. So the Wednesday comes along. He shows up. There's the usual 30 or 40 people in the room. I see him making notes and he says, yeah, I think I can get something in this Saturday. I said, that's great. Saturday morning, I wake up later than most people wake up, you know, 11, 1130. And I have an answering machine. I've always liked tech, and I was one of the first people to have an actual answering machine in my home. This would have been 1976. And there's 42 messages on it. And normally there'd be three. And every one of the messages said, Mark, go get a globe. Mark, go get the globe. Mark, you won't believe what's in the globe. So I went out, I got a globe, and there was a two-page spread on this radical approach to comedy that's never been seen before. It was just glowing. The next week on the Wednesday, I went down to the 519 ready to do the show. And I arrived as usual about an hour before to set the room up. And there was a lineup to get in. And I counted. 
and there were 900 people waiting to get in. And it never Holy stopped from shit. there. That was the power of the press in those days. So, okay, now two years pass, and I'm doing the shows every, every, two, every Wednesday night, and it's a big hit, and everybody loves it, and it's crazy. And a friend of mine um, comes to town who was studying business at Stanford, uh, and he was a real business whiz, and his parents were millionaires, and um, he grew up in a real business environment. And he said, what are you doing these days? And I said, well, I'm doing this comedy thing on, on Wednesday nights. I said, you want to come? He said, sure. So he comes down. He watches the show. I said, what did you think? He said, well, the comedy wasn't really for me, but you've got a business here, a real business. I said, I do? He said, yeah. And if you let me, I'll, I'll be your partner and I'll take it, uh, I'll take it full time in, in a real club. I said, okay. So it took us a long time to be able to find that club, which was the Bay and Yorkville Club. Um, and uh, we had to bash out walls. We had to create it from scratch to be exactly what we wanted it to be. How long did that one last? I don't think I ever saw that Oh, one. that was a great club. I wish uh, I saw it. Started in 78, closed in 2002, okay. roughly. Yeah. That's when we went to Young and Egg. Um, so... Uh, it became. It was now. It was not a huge success right off the bat. We had a huge success on opening night, of course, but uh, it was a struggle to get people in, and lots of people left. Oh wow, did they leave? They couldn't stand it. A third of the audience would walk out every night because of the language, the content, especially me. So what would happen is I'd be on stage, and two people would get up. A couple, usually an older couple. And they would walk out, and they wouldn't just quietly walk out. They'd walk out in a really sort of, you know, noisy way to show that they w did not approve. And I would go after them. I love that. I always loved that note in your book. Yeah, as they, as they walked out. And um, uh, I would say, <laughs> okay, go back to your stupid suburban life, blah, 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 blah. Go back, but just know one thing. And then I would whip out my wallet, take money out of my wallet, wave it in their faces and say, the Jew has your money. <laughs> the Jew has your money. And then I'd get everyone to chant the jew has your money the jew has your money the jew has your money as they all as they left and everybody would applaud now what would happen after that sometimes is that this couple uh would write a letter because remember there was no internet in those days they would write a letter to the owner not realizing i'm the owner yep. because they can't believe that an owner would ever insult hey, the patrons <laughs> yeah but we used to have a saying at yuck yucks the customer is always in the way um, so uh, they would write me a letter saying, I was at your place and I was appalled by what I saw. It was an insult to uh, the Lord and uh, young people were there and um, you're encouraging them to indulge in sex and drugs and uh, blah, blah, blah. So what I did was I had a stamp made up, a rubber stamp that said in huge block letters, eat shit and die, <laughs> the Yuck Yucks management. And then I would take the letter, I would stamp it, and because these people were so stupid that they uh, actually had a return address on their, on their envelope, I would just mail it back to them. Uh, needless to say, I never saw them again. I wish I had that stamp because it would, it would go in a museum someday. Yeah, 100%. It's, yeah. it's fascinating, like, it, but it also makes so much sense that like the business owner of a comedy club would have these values and principles, would you'd hope, because it's like if... A comedy club runs on principles that every well, other business runs on. Well, then. I would like to say that that should be true, but you know, I don't think Bud Friedman ever ran his the, the improv. Oh, the improv. I don't think he ever ran the improv chain that yeah, way. I, I don't think Mitzi it. Shore ever ran the comedy store that way. There's still some like questionable and like not non traditional business yeah. practices. Well, at the at the store more than at the improvs. The improvs. Do you know who owns the improvs now? No, I don't. AMC. No way. Yeah. Yeah, oh they, bought it, they bought it be just before the pandemic. I mean, pandemic. good investment, though. It's kind of good to know that they'll keep growing and maybe sustain if they're owned by someone with that much financial backing. No, unfortunately, AMC is almost bankrupt. Oh, um, God. Which is why half of the improvs have closed. They used to have much. 20 clubs. They have about 10 now. And then they have 10 what I'll call rogue clubs, which are... Um, they still use the name improv and they probably pay a royalty, but they don't book them through head office. They have their own websites, things like that. I think it's, um, 
fascinating, but it also makes sense that anyone would who would start a comedy club, it's because they have a vested interest in performing themselves. They care about like the punk element, like they want like You would think so, but that's not necessarily well, true. And it wasn't true in those in those days. They were people who were basically bar owners or restaurateurs right. and they heard this comedy thing was hot. Well nowadays, when like now that there's really not much money in it, or at least the ones that I've seen kind of pop up around Toronto or like owned or managed at least by oh, I know you mean the store what I call storefront clubs, storefront right? clubs? yeah they're sure. storefront clubs I don't think any of the people who uh, start those are really expecting to make to make a killing the place is too small yeah. they're all 40 seats what can you really do with 40 seats you know maybe you can pull enough money in to pay your rent which is yeah. great um, and you get to go on stage, and which you get to hang out part. with your friends, yeah. and you get to meet girls or boys or whatever you want. There's a social aspect of this that should never be ignored. One of the reasons I did this was because I wanted to meet people, and I'm not a guy to go to a bar, and they didn't have all those things you do these days of swiping. There was no internet, so I thought this was a good way, and you know what? It was. It was? It was. I met lots of people. What do you make of, speaking of like uh, the TikTok and the swiping, Like, what do you make of how comedy has evolved to this day and age with all that. Well, because you've been around kind of since the inception of comedy in Canada. I'll yeah. Say. Anybody who has, you know, anybody who thinks they can launch their career from TikTok, I think is dreaming because they just don't have the sustainability. It's a you different skill set too. Yeah. It's a different skill set and it's, it eats you up and it throws you out. Oh my God. So, it hurts you. Like, it hurts your soul. It's completely in the opposite way that performing stand up does where it f fills you. I was talking uh, with Mike Wilmot about this, that I've, I've already started to notice the way that uh, the TikTok stand-up or just like the phenomenon of having stand-up on TikTok has a kind of bastardized and perverted stand-up itself because you see people on stage now doing something that they, isn't working on stage but they know will work based on editing and based on algorithms that'll end up working on TikTok. So they don't even care about the live element because like it's like you'd hope it's like, well, we're here for the live experience. It's going to be chopped up in such a way that people are going to miss all the context, miss, mix the... Well, you're right about all of this, um, but these are not people who are thinking about having a 40-year career. Um, people who do, who do TikTok, I don't think they think... I don't think current, the current generation of people, whether they're comedians or non-comedians, really think very far into the future. we don't know that we have 40 years left on Earth. Well, maybe that's part of the I reason. I feel like that might be why there's so much, and also things change so quickly now. Right. But yeah, it, it is really like, it's too scary to think even a few years into the future, because in a few years in the past, it was already so different. But you know, so different. Olivia, I'm trying to sort of train people and teach people to have a skill set that will last for a very long time yeah. because live performance will never go out of style and the Mervish has proved that as soon as we came back from uh, COVID uh, you know one of the first things I wondered is how are the Mervishes going to manage to keep um, you know four big theaters open you know where they need to get 2,000 people in a, a, a performance six eight shows a week that's a lot of people. And you know what? They all bounced back because people have a hungry, hungry need to commune with strangers oh, yeah. in a, an environment and watch performance. It's so true. And it's very... This will never end. I'm happy to hear you say that because it's like it can be so pessimistic. This like, will never it end. But yeah, it the, is It, it will wax and it will wane, but it will never end. Hmm. I know, because it just gives you a totally different feeling than when you're scrolling on your phone. It's like maybe Ugh. there's the same entertainers, but the quality of entertainment is completely different. Completely different. And, you know, there are TikTok pe uh, people always, you know, contact me saying, I've got, uh, you know, half a million people watching my TikToks. I want to headline your club. And I don't, I don't respond. I, it's not the same thing. And I know, having done a little research into this, that people who are TikTokers and try to, uh, you know, headline in a club, yeah, they'll draw the people. And then the people will be very disappointed at what mm -hmm. they see. Yeah. Because it's just not there. So. So yeah. there. So there. Okay, Mark Breslin has solved TikTok, the TikTok economy, and the problems surrounding comedy that we thought happened. But... We're not okay. So you, one thing I really love throughout your book and throughout your opening monologue to this podcast is that you, your favorite thing has always been to say what you're not supposed to say. You know, you're very punk that way. You're very like a huge proponent of free speech and all that. How do you make of 
the way that it's kind of been re defined that like free speech is kind of like a like a dog whistle or like a synonym for hate speech in this day and age like people have kind of been like if you believe in free speech don't go there they say the things you're not supposed to say has it always been like that or do you think it's different now well what's uh, been the flashpoints have changed for instance when i first started it was all about language it was all about the fact that people used four letter words right. and 12 letter words it wasn't about the content so much as the language and that was a fight that we had to endure for a, lo a long time for years and years people would not come to yuck Hicks because that's the place where they they say fuck on yeah. stage so um and i'm proud to be the guy who now you know i was before rap uh, everybody was coming to yuck Hicks and hearing the word fuck on stage wow um but it meant something then yeah. It doesn't mean so much now, but it meant something then. Then it changed, and it became um, the f uh, sort of second wave feminists got after us uh, because they felt that uh, there was a lot of anti-woman, there was a lot of woman bashing. There was also a lot of men bashing from the, uh, from the women, too. It worked both ways, but there were so few women at the time that you didn't notice it, maybe. Um, so we had to endure that. So when I uh, brought in Sam Kinison, uh, for instance, there were pickets. And the picket said, feminists for a healthy humor. And I thought, healthy humor? Well, if you know anything about comics, you know that they're not healthy. <laughs> um, that's sort of like saying uh, a sober orgy. Um, it's just <laughs> not going to happen. Um, so we had to endure that. Then it w f bounced back the other way. Uh, and you had the Howard Stern effect, where there were all these people, all these m comics going on Howard Stern and saying whatever they wanted to say was really a free speech zone and people started to expect it. They w I'd say that was like early 90s, mid 90s, and it was a great time for us. And now what's happened is um, people are, uh, the woke generation has come along and said, well, we want only comedy that is positive, that presents people in a positive light. It shouldn't ins insult people. Um, it certainly shouldn't insult people because of their race, color, creed. Um, and you know, in real life, I agree with all of this. In real life, I believe in equality. In real life, I believe in social justice. But public performance is a different animal. And you know, comics are very often trying to m figure out the places in between truths it's much more interesting to them and to show hypocrisies of this sort of thing and right now because the woke thing is so big that's where you look for the hypocrisies um so it bounces back left right left right left right and right now um there's a lot of uh, uh problems with the left not liking what uh comedy clubs do or at least free comic comedy clubs do there was a big issue for me. There was a flashpoint of Louis C.K. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, uh, just before COVID, I brought in Louis C.K. Yeah. Well, there were, uh, there were only three clubs in all of North America who dared do that. Three. I know that they were... Uh, uh, New York Magazine did an article where they approached comedy club owners and said, would you book Louis C.K.? And I know they went to the comedy bar, and I know that Gary said, no, we would not do that. We would never book Louis C.K. And I thought, yeah, okay, well, there's the difference, I guess. I was not afraid to do it. And you know what? Everybody said, oh, your business is going to suffer. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. Not only did we sell out his shows in 45 minutes, but there was an uptick uh, in th the attendance numbers for a good six to eight weeks afterwards because of the publicity we got. See, I think the people who turned off Yuck Yucks because of the content turned off long ago. Yeah. They turned off because of me. They turned off because of Sam Kinison. They turned off because of Mike McDonald. They turned off because of all kinds of people. Jason Rouse, you name it. We have lots of those kinds of comics. And so they weren't going to come anyway. So the people that we have, and I'm very lucky. I work on a small scale. My rooms are, you know, two, 300 people as opposed to 2,000 people. I don't Are there have any clubs with 2,000 seats? No. That would be insane. No. But, but there's network television. There's cable television. And you have to watch what you say. If, if you play just for laughs, you can't do that kind of material. You certainly can't do it and expect to go on one of their television shows. That's for sure. But I don't have to worry about any of that. I have to get a relatively small number of people into my clubs. And I can segment the marketplace finely enough to be able to get those people and not worry about whether the other people don't like it. Look, my father once said it's not 
don't worry about the girls who won't go to the prom with you. It's the one who says yes that counts. Yeah. And the, similarly, it's the people who say, yes, we want to see uh, what you're doing and we like what you're doing, not the people who disapprove of you. I mean, I've never liked people that appeal to everyone anyways. Uh, that's vanilla. It's fake. Right? That's what it is. It's fake. Yeah, although I can point to uh, artists that I, I do like that appeal For to sure. everyone. I mean, you know. I shouldn't say appeal. I more just mean people who, I guess, pander to everyone. Look, I love Jerry Seinfeld. And not everyone likes him. Really? Yeah. I can't imagine somebody not liking Jerry Seinfeld. You know what, though? I think the reason people don't like him, though, is because of him personally rather than his comedy. Because his comedy does, of course, appeal to everyone. And what do they all, don't they like about him personally? He's rich and successful? Maybe. But I know. I I'd say he, there's I, a little jealousy there. You yeah. know that Jerry Seinfeld's the only comic who has a billion dollars I know. In the bank. I, I listened to you say that on a podcast. It, it, like, floors, damn, it just damn. floors me because I used to I used to hire him for, you know, $200 a show. Wow. <laughs> we in, joked about this the last Toronto? time I saw him. Yeah. Wow. Toronto, Niagara Falls. We, uh, we, had a, we booked him in a whole bunch of places. That's so cool. Okay, wait. Speaking of, uh, you brought your dad up briefly. In one of the first chapters of your book, you talked about your sisters are like 20 or 19 years older than you. Your parents are a lot older than you. How much of their of your success did they get to witness? Um, quite a bit. That's amazing. Uh, quite a bit. My, my father died just before I got the big Joan Rivers job. Wow. Uh, but So he never saw that. But he saw me on the cover of all the magazines That's and everything. Good. Now I'll tell you a story about my dad. You know, my parents were not thrilled with what I did for a living. But they still seem to applaud you as a... Not my mother. Not your mom? My mother, till her dying day, said, I wish you had been a lawyer. She well, said, there's absolutely no uh, dignity in what you do. I thought it was interesting, and not to uh, switch topics, because I still want to hear more about yeah, your parents, sure. but... Um, I thought it was interesting that you said like it was so charming to be a comedian at 25, but then I turned 40 and it was a lot less dignified. So I segued to purely business and I. Yeah. And it's not purely business. I mean, I still, you know, write uh, comedy and, yeah, produce uh, and and I do charity work. I do a lot of public speaking and it's impossible for me to, you know, give a speech without having some humor in it. Yeah. Um, so it's not like I'm completely what happened. Keep going. Okay. Uh, it's not like I'm completely uh, away from the creative end of it. But, um, yeah, it, it felt like it wasn't me anymore to perform in a comedy club night after night after night. And if you're not going to do it night after night after night, you shouldn't do it. It's like being a part-time boxer. You're going to get your yeah. nose broken. Yeah. You know, it's just not, not a good idea. Um, but to get back to my, my parents, no, my, my mother was so against it. Oh, so against it. You see, there's a bit of a backstory here because my mother grew up in show business because my grandfather, Max Shore, was the artistic director of the Yiddish Theater in Toronto yeah. when Yiddish Theater meant a lot. When it existed. Did yeah, that it still exist? No, yeah, not at all. So. Um, all the Yiddish theaters basically closed after World War II because Yiddish was considered the language of the concentration camps and Israel and Hebrew was considered what you wanted to do. So when I went to Hebrew school, I never once learned one Yiddish word, but everything was in Hebrew. So yeah. um, anyway, uh, my father, my grandfather had a tough life because, you know, he was in the theater. That's not an easy life. And my mother resented that, I guess, for the rest of her life and did not want to see me go into anything like that. She even said to me, okay, look, if you said you wanted to be an actor, I wouldn't like it, but I would understand it. But a comedian, that's as low as it gets. My, uh, my father w was not a confrontational person in any way. Um, so he never said anything bad, but I figured he didn't like what I did, although he was a businessman. Uh, and so when he came to the club, he noticed that people paid for the product before they got the product and that there were no refunds. Unlike his shirt business, he liked that. That w impressed him. But here's how I know he really was impressed. When he died, I had that thankless task of cleaning out his wardrobe, right? So he had a, he was a natty dresser and he had all his shirts folded, which uh, men used to do. They used to get them folded from the dry cleaners, right? From the laundry. And so he had them all stacked in drawers. And as I pulled them out, he had a, uh, an, a, mag a magazine or newspaper article about me um, in between each shirt. 
so that every day That's so cute. Yeah. Every day when he would go to put on a nice he would go to put on a you new want your shirt. Thank for the thankless task. There it is. He would see he would see his son and then he would I guess put that at the bottom of the of the pile. That's very hard. So I suppose that my father was okay with it. When did your mom die then? So my mother died, I guess, 1994. So I would have been... Yeah, I was born. We didn't even cross over. 40. So she, I would have been 42. 42. Yeah. So you had... I had them for a long on. time. Yeah. Um, you know, when, my, when I was born, my father cried because um, he was 53 when, when I was born. Wow. That's Yeah, but I was 58 when my son was born, so I guess there's wow. a... Wow. I, I beat him on that one. Yeah. Um, but uh, he was... He, we come from a very good line of uh, DNA, and I think my father had something like seven brothers, They uh, and and five of them lived past 90, including my dad. So, but when he, when I was born, he cried because he said, I'll, ne- I'll never even get to see his bar mitzvah. And he saw my bar mitzvah, and he saw a lot more that came after that. So, it all kind of worked out. That's so. It's so not it's how many. Look, I have friends who. You've had. Look, I have friends whose parents have died when they were teenagers. Yeah. And they weren't particularly old parents. It happens. You probably, I mean, have still. I feel like you have a long way to go still. You have your son now, which you said you would never get married or have a kid. I know. But that was 20 years ago. So it's like, of course, you're in a totally different place in your life. I know. Look, I I don't resent uh, for a moment uh, making those choices, but I often do wonder what would have happened if uh, I hadn't made them. Um, I was in certainly no, I did not have an interest in having a family. Uh, I had a real interest in having an audience. Well, and, I think everything happens as it's meant to. But everything happens as it's meant to. And, you know, it was the right woman at the right time. Yeah. And then we had our child. We did not try. All my friends who were, you know, so much younger than than me were, you know, going for all these treatments and IBFs and all kinds of, you know, ridiculously pricey things. My wife and I just went to Cabo and got drunk. I mean, it was that easy. It was so easy that it was meant to be. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny as you just said your dad worried he'd never get to see your bar mitzvah. He was 53 when you were born. You were 58 when your son was born. He's 12 now. Bar mitzvah That's years right. next year. That's right. Is he having a bar mitzvah? Maybe. Maybe. Not sure yet. No? Has he picked out a theme? Not well, we're that? not very religious people. Right. And my wife is not Jewish. And you see, when I, I like was... most Jews in this day and age aren't really... Yeah, unless they're it's really... It's more of a cultural thing anyways. really, really... Uh, Orthodox. And that's almost a different thing at and this point than like the whole... classic Toronto Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, my wife is, is, no, is not Jewish, as I say. And when I was growing up, all my friends were Jewish. Every single one of my friends were Jew- was Jewish, except my best friend in grade six, Brian Gilmore. And I was told not to see him by my parents because his, par- his parents were divorced. <laughs> and that obviously meant that there was something wrong with him. Um, but every one of uh, every other friend of mine was Jewish. So you know, the year of when I was thirteen, on Saturdays I was going to a bar mitzvah every single week. Now Jackson, my son, I don't think any of his friends are Jewish. And well, that's because you signed him up for some weird scam. Well, yeah, school. he's in an odd school, but we're yeah. also in a neighborhood that isn't particularly Jewish. Wait, can you? I think we were off air when you described the school that your son goes to. Can you yeah. describe it again? Um, yeah, he won't be going there next year because it ends at grade six. But for the last three years, he's been at a school called the Gr- Gradale <laughs> Academy. And it, yeah, it's a private school. But um, it's an unusual school in that it is entirely 100% outdoors modeled on these Scandinavian experiments in the 70s. And the reason that we sent him there was because of COVID. And we oh. felt as long as he was outside, um, he was pretty going to be pretty safe. And there's also so few people in the school. I mean, he has six kids in his class. That's Did he it. complain about getting cold in the winter? <laughs> we put an extra park on him. <laughs> you know, or they would, ha- they would call a snow day. Oh, I think there were like six snow days pretty much each year where we just kept him home. But... No, there, there's, an, oh, there's a kind of covering in the brickworks. And that's another thing. It's not just that it's outside. It's at the brickworks. And I don't yeah, know what you know beautiful. about the brickworks. But, you know, his, his first class would be biology, and they would go to the pond and watch the beavers build their dams. That's amazing. So, you know, it was firsthand experience of nature. 
Um, and he loves computers and he loves games. And this is such a good, you know, alternative to that during the day. When he comes home, he just he wants to play on his on his devices. But he can't do that at that school. There's too much going on, you know, in terms of natural things and environmental things. It really has led to a, a real knowledge for him of environmental awareness. So it turned out to be a really good good place to send them, even though I admit it's probably not a Harvard prep school. It's it still kind of easy. Valuable, especially to counteract all of the screen time. Well, not once has he ever said, oh, I don't feel like going to school today. And oh, every child says that. I know. I love to hear that. But he never says that. Well, you also mentioned before we started that you were sending your son to Second City to take some classes. Yes. What's his interest in comedy like? How do you feel about that? Do you want uh, him to be a stand-up or a comic? I don't want him to be anything other than what he wants yeah. to be. So whatever he discovers and he decides to go with, my job is to just make it as easy for him as possible and to encourage it as much as possible. Look, I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was 12. What do I know about what I really wanted to yeah, do? Yeah, you watch the land before time. That's right, yeah. or, or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, well, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. And it changed, you know, many, many times. When I was in university, I went to Glendon College for the first two years, which is a, an offshoot of York. And at that time, especially, it was founded by uh, former Prime Minister Lester Pearson as a place to uh, groom career diplomats wow. and I thought this is what I wanted to do because it wasn't I didn't think it was going to be a desk job I'd get to travel um, problem was French you had to become fluent in French Who's and I spent that? so many hours in those language labs and I had to take my courses in French and I just couldn't handle it and I finally gave up after two years and went to the regular main campus and studied English literature yeah, it's and like politics. I, I wish that I, they had been ingrained into me more, but I really feel like language is also like, it's kind of like math. Like either you get it or you don't. Like it and I wasn't good brain. at math either, so Same. maybe there's a connection. Same sister, that's why we're both here. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, what's, what's next? Let's see how much time we have left. I don't want to exhaust your time. Okay. Okay, so... Like I said, you you stopped doing stand up when you were around forty. Do you ever miss it? Would yes, you ever every do it day. Again? Yeah, every day. Would you ever go back on stage and perform again? Not I know you said you give your speeches and those have comedy. Not in them. that kind of a way. I yeah. think there's more chance that I would do some kind of a one man show in a theater. That would be incredible. Where I could tell the stories I'm telling you. Yeah. And make sure I throw in enough laughs that right. people are feel they got their money's worth. Yeah. Um. And every day I write a joke. I mean, something comes to me that I think is funny. You got to start a TikTok or a Twitter or something. Put your joke on a platform um i just don't like those platforms yeah, I'm, i like being cancerous. live or i i'll write another book or yeah. something like that hey i'm 71 years old um i i have wrestled the new technologies to a draw you know i'm not really i'm not really one with them yeah, you're not uh, for, but i still yeah. use them right i know people my age don't even have email i mean it's well that's insane uh, insane well i guess 71 like you don't seem 71 you seem a lot younger and probably that's a testament to your genealogy and you'll probably keep well i yeah i think it's what i do for a living right um keeps me young um and you have a young son now i have too. a young son that adds to it is he active on these things and does he encourage you to use yes he's constantly telling me things i have no idea what he's talking about he's good at it too yeah, like I all bet. kids can do it but he's particularly good at it so he knows all kinds of tricks look if i have a problem with my phone kids are I, amazing with it though. i don't insane. go to i don't go to my rogers store i just hand it to my son and he fixes it that's incredible um okay so let me ask you some so you watch stand up, obviously it's your job. What what are uh, some of your pet peeves or gripes when you watch stand ups today? Like, do you have? Well, people aren't doing jokes, uh, is a problem. People think it's funny enough to just get up there and talk about their life, and their lives aren't that interesting, right. frankly. So, uh, the other thing that bothers me is that um, when I started doing stand up, and for quite a while afterwards, um, you went to see the comic because. He or she was nothing like you. They were freakish. They were eccentric. They were marginalized, truly marginalized. I don't mean that they had, uh, they had a different skin color or a different religion. I mean, they were nuts, I know, that frankly. was, yeah. They were nuts. I mean, I was great friends with uh, Gilbert Gottfried. I'm still good friends with Emo Phillips. These are the people I adore. And um, they're just 
they just see things differently. Now you go to uh, so many of the people in the audience go and they love it because they're saying just what I'm thinking. They're just like me. Right. But if they're just like you, why would you really go? You're supposed to go uh, appreciate entertainment to see people if they're just like you on a much higher level. So, you know, to me, these geniuses... I mean, that's probably like like Jerry Seinfeld kind of like spawned off like a generation of people. It's just like, oh, you can just be real. You don't have to be like a freak. You can just be like a normal person. And then it inspired a generation of people. He is a freak. He is a freak. Yeah, he's a freak. How so? I'm just saying he's a freak. Okay. He He can... you get him get him to tell you but but you know he's he's obsess- he's an obsessive compulsive right. there's one thing you know he only wears his running shoes once i guess billionaires can do what they do but even when he wasn't a billionaire he didn't like having a scuff mark on his wow on his running shoes i mean that's just an example i sat there once in a diner in los angeles out of earshot he thought he, I was out of earshot, but he was talking with, he was having brunch with George Wallace, his good friend, and they were talking about a joke that Jerry did. And they argued, not argued, but they discussed for over an hour whether it should be an a ah or a the in the joke. I love that. You know, that's not normal. It's not normal, but it also is like, obviously a testament to like where he is. And Yeah, he's a perfectionist. Yeah, like I, I, I heard that. Perfectionism is a sickness. That's true. <laughs> he used to write and write and write just pages and pages for eight hours a day, nonstop. Every yeah, and, day. I, and I guess if you want to be a billionaire, um, maybe that's what you have to do. But what I, I most, um, what I most miss about stand up today is uh, so many people are doing this without any character, characterization. Right. And I believe, and I'm not the first person to say this, that all comedy starts with character, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, Jack Benny could get laughs just by holding his elbow and giving a look to the audience. And people go crazy because they knew what that meant. Right. Or Jeremy Hotz is another example. He could read the phone book. It would be funny because of the, his wine and you know what the character is all about. And so many comics now don't do that. They just have, um, you know, their quote unquote material. But until you have a character... No one's going to give you a sitcom. No one's going to put you in a, in, in a show. Uh, you're only going to be working, you know, live or on, uh, on electronic media at the best, doing your act. You've got to do things that are more than your act. And if you think about it, what really, what really creates character in a comic is what I'll, I'll call the comic flaw. Mm-hmm. There's got to be something wrong with you that's obvious to the audience, but not to you. And as an example, and you got to sum it up in a word, like uh, Woody Allen is neurotic, Roseanne Barr is vulgar, uh, Jerry Seinfeld is fussy. And these are things which in real life, no one would want to have anything to do with you. But because you're doing it on stage, amplified in a context with a frame around it, it's like a it, freak show. It's it like you... becomes art. Yeah. So um, this, this is what makes a great comic. And so many comics just don't have that. I wonder if like it's a symptom of like like a variety of factors. One being that we're also obsessed with success. Like we're not going out and like having experiences because we're like, well, I need to be home working. I need to make a TikTok. I need to make a podcast. I need to make a blah, blah, blah. And then like a combination of things like also like the podcast thing. It's like you want to be a relatable human on a thing, on a podcast. And also if you're too flawed, you're worried that you're going to be canceled. Like there's a bunch of a variety of factors that maybe contribute to people being less freakish yeah, I, in stand-up I, nowadays. Yeah, I agree. I also think that we're all consuming the same culture Yeah. Uh, because everything has gone global. Oh, yeah. And in the old days, old days, God, that's an awful term. But when I was, you know, first getting into this, so much comedy was local and specific. You know, I mean, if I can compare it to novelists, I could say, you know, uh, Mordecai Richler, had a whole career writing about four streets in Montreal. Wow, right? that's cool. When you think about it. But the, what happens in those four streets took the particular into the universal. Right. And that's what you really also want to do as an artist. You want to um, start with a particular, but there is no particular anymore well, because we're all living on uh, on the web. I would argue that like two of the most like recent uh, Toronto or Canadian successes have been like... A, Ryan Long and Nima Nazari, who did a lot of Toronto-based content, but they're still popular. 
on a more universal level because it's like what you said, taking the particular, turning it into a universal. Yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of comics don't think about. Right. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, who are your favorite comics to nope. watch that are working today? You nope. want to answer that no, question? No, no, that's no, because no everybody you? I leave out will be upset. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, I think we can actually wrap this up pretty soon. I have one last question. Sure. So I um, I don't know if this still exists, but something that's been controversial for your club in the past few years has been like the exclusivity clause in the Yuck Yucks thing. Um, basically meaning that if you work with Yuck Yucks, you can't work with other clubs. Does this still exist? Yes and no. And it always was a yes and no answer. It was always a Swiss cheese kind of agreement. You know, you can't do this. Well, well, that you can do. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't do this. But wait a minute. Actually, if you do it on a, on a Tuesday, it's fine. Right. We're, we're trying to leverage what we have into some kind of successful company that's sustainable. And that's really important. And the only way we can be sustainable is by having a competitive edge with everybody else. Since we kind right. of invented this, right. we feel we have the right to try to do it. But we, we, it's based on a lot, of, a lot of things that people don't really think about. Like, how come I never hire Americans? I loved hearing you talk about this. Okay, so I never hire Americans, or I shouldn't say never. I rarely hire Americans. But the trade-off is I will protect your market. Canadian comics right. if you will protect mine right I would argue though that it only makes your roster of comics better if they can do as many stages as possible in the beginning that's absolutely true but then you right. get to a point where once we sign you um, you should be good enough to do anything anywhere we don't sign people until they're they're really really able to do things. But you can always get better, and it always is valuable to keep. Everybody better. gets better. I mean, you know, you do. I, I love to hear when people say, you know, hey, I'm taping my album, and they've been at it for eight months. Well, I'll Same. tell you something. <laughs> Three years from now, they're going to look back on that album. They're going to be so embarrassed. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I continue to have that problem. I know I'm still relatively new, but every time I'm like, I should have something so that I have something to share. But then I know the second I do that, I'm going to be like, I wish I did it now that I'm better. But then I know every couple months I already feel like I'm a little bit better. So You get better fast early and then it yeah. tapers off. Right. Then you get better maybe 10% a year Yeah. Um, because you're f refining what you do. But the hard, real hard work of getting to where you want to be is in the first four or five years, I think. Right. Do you have anything else you want to add? Anything else that we went unspoken? Actually, wait, and I think we got to circle back to the first question I asked that we never got really addressed because I so rudely didn't ask you about your history first and foremost. Sure. Um, I'm sure people are dying to know you are responsible in some ways for acts like Jim Carrey, Howie Mandel, Norm MacDonald. Do you have any anecdotes you want to share? Well, um, sure. You have to realize that all these people I have a different relationship with. And some of them were great. Some of them were not so great. Some of them were great and then became not so great or the other way around or it goes up and down. You know, you're dealing with hum human beings here and it's not simple. It's never simple. Mm -hmm. I could tell you that Howie Mandel and I clicked from the very beginning, and we still click. Yeah, we probably come from he a mentions similar. Mentions you on every podcast. Yeah, I know, and on. that's so nice it's of very him. Nice. I type in Mark Breslin on the podcast app. There's a few of you, but then ninety percent of them is everything Howie Mandel's ever been on. See, here's what I loved about Howie. Um, he would do anything, and I mean anything, to get a laugh, and that was so un-Canadian at the time. Yeah, there was nothing like it. There'd never been anything like it. Um, he had no dignity at all and in i mean that in the best of yeah. of, of compliments um norm mcdonald i i loved and in fact i i won't read it to you but i have a a letter he wrote to me when i got my order of canada that told told me how much i meant to him and he's not a guy to be sentimental he's not a very sentimental right. person yeah. so coming from him it meant an awful lot um jim carrey was a different story I didn't, you didn't like him right away. No, because at the time, especially, he was doing Rich Little. He was doing Rich Little's act, and he was doing it really well. But I wasn't looking for to find the next Rich Little. I was looking to find the next Lenny Bruce. Right. And he was nothing like that. He loved show business. Everybody else kind of was, kind of ambivalent about it or openly sneered at it, including myself. And I just couldn't understand why, he didn't see it as a hollow, shallow enterprise. When he moved to Los Angeles. Uh, he started hanging out with a different kind of crowd, 
and he became much more interesting. And of course, that's when he became a movie star. But um, although we hadn't connected, um, he was the one who uh, made a tape, which he never does. He made a tape for me for the when I got the um, inducted into the Canadian Comedy Hall of Fame a few months ago. It was really funny too. Wow, <laughs> really funny. That's pretty cool. Okay, if I can keep you for one more thing, actually, yeah. this is a dumb question, but you said in your oh, and we never talked about Joan Rivers enough. Do you have a little more time? What time is it? It's now? fifty-seven minutes into this podcast. What time is it? Yeah, it's three o'clock. Okay, sure. Let's okay. let's go. Tell, you worked with Joan Rivers, and everyone's yes, going to want to know what it was like to work with the queen. Well, she was a queen. Yeah. She was excellent to work with. She, I never had a bad moment with her, not one. Um, here's how you can judge a star is how, by how they treat the writers. I, I was not a writer on the show. I was a producer on the show. But I would go into the writer's room, and she would be sitting there kibitzing with them. That almost never happens. I will contrast that with Johnny Carson. Um, I had a friend who was uh, in the writer's room f with, uh, for Johnny's show, for The Tonight Show, and I asked him. He'd been working there, I think, eight years. I said, so what's Johnny really like? He said, I don't know. I've never talked to him. Crazy. Johnny would only talk to the head writer. The head writer would bring the material from the other writers. You can sort of see this on the Maisel, on the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel show. Um, there's a whole story arc this year about... Um, oh, it's still going on? I watched the first season. I loved it. I guess I just Yeah, this off. is season four. It's the last season. Okay. But um, there's a whole... They do a whole uh, story arc about her working on a show which is a lot like The Tonight Show. And the host does that. He does not really treat the writers very well. Joan treated her writers just great. And she treated me just great. So I have nothing bad to say about Joan. I think it's tragic that she died in a way that she should not have died. That was a weird operation. It was a routine thing, th that surgery, and she should still be I with us. I should know this, but what happened? How did she die? She went in for another, you know, one Plastic of those, a facelift yeah. or something like that, and she never came out of it. Well, I guess... Uh, you know, it, you every, you live. well, know. every, every time you go for an operation and they put you under, you're risking death. Yeah. That's how, that's how Kanye's mom died, which is like insane to be getting plastic surgery. I guess it's like a kind of a mental disease in the end when you're still doing that. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't think she looked particularly better because she got plastic surgery. No. You know, I, she was obsessed with it. She was, she was in some way a, a vain and shallow woman. But I think that's kind of what made her. But she played prolific. it for laughs. Yeah. She made fun of herself. She made fun of. I, I thought like, it's funny to watch her specials back, and it's like, damn, like you just went up there and you just made fun of like a f celebrity that you like hang out with. Like yeah. I think that's really. Look, it was <laughs> an, and it, it was yeah. kind of like you know um, going to uh, you know uh, Sea World and getting splashed by the whale. Yeah, it's kind of an honor. Yeah. So in a similar way, you know, if Joan made fun of you, it was kind of an honor. I mean, I love being made fun of. I know a lot of people don't like being made fun of. So here, well, <laughs> she usually knew how to pick it. Right. And sometimes she got it wrong. I mean, I think Liz Taylor called her and said, please stop. Just stop. Wow. When you make fun of someone, though, you're kind of like trusting them to like that they know that it's a joke, which is kind of, yeah, it's an honor. It's beautiful. Although but. you've noticed this has stopped in comedy clubs. Yeah. I used to make fun of the audience all the time. Uh, no one would do that anymore. Nobody would walk out there and sing, what are you doing here, you fat fuck? It's funny. To the person in the, in the, in the, uh, in the front row. And <laughs> yet, you definitely can't fat shame anymore. That's just... Well, there's just one example, yeah. you know, uh, of that. Nobody does that anymore. Lisa Lampanelli stopped doing her act. She stopped doing stand up altogether. That's right because she's she, like a motivational speaker. That's or something right because now. she felt she had to had to stop it because nobody would put up with it. I do find though when I watch back my own tapes, which I watch back every every set that I do, it's funny because I'm like that is when people like me the most when I'm being mean to the audience. But I watch myself cut myself off even though I remember having something else to say and then coming off stage and say, being, oh, I'm glad I didn't say that. I had something really evil to say, and then watching the set and being like, they would have liked that. I, I still trust the audience to like it sometimes. Sure. It depends. And as somebody who used to uh, pick on the audience as part of what I did, it wasn't the only thing that I did, um, I would have to figure out right, away, right at the top when I would walk out on stage, I'd have to look at them and figure out who wanted to play yeah. and who didn't want to play. And I got good at that. And I almost never made mistakes after a while. Yeah. Sometimes I did, and it wasn't, wasn't good. 
Yeah, it's never good when you pick on someone who's kind of giving you every signal not to. Yeah, and but I learned I learned the signals and the body language and the way they looked at you and all the rest of it of who and who they were with, um, of who was open to it and who wasn't. And you know, in those days, the reputation was such that people would say, either, um, don't put me in the front, please, no front seats for me. I don't want to be picked on, or put us in the front. It's my friend's birthday. I really want to see him get slammed. <laughs> so, you know, y it would be both. Yeah. Okay, so one thing you said in your book is that you had, this is 2002, at that point, you had never cooked a meal it's in your life. Pretty much true. Is that still true? I reheat. You reheat? I reheat. From restaurants? Yeah. Are you aware of uh, seed oils? Do you know what's going on with the seed oils? Oh, listen, I don't even think about what I eat. Uh, that's a that's that's a the whole seed new oils way. they use now. It's a whole new way. I I'm I am convinced that everything I make for myself um, is probably bad for me. But this ingredients they use seed oils and everything at restaurants now, which destroys your mitochondria. I don't know if you know about. That. I'm 71. I know. I feel I've already won. I feel I've already You've won. You've already got a pretty good run. I've already had a good run. <laughs> I'm going to eat what I want. Okay, so no, no worry about the seed oils. But I don't think about any of this stuff. Okay, maybe much look to the chagrin of my wife, much to the chagrin of my family. <laughs> but I, I feel that my friends, I don't care. I guess it's one of those things where it's like 150 year old ladies smoking cigarettes. Meanwhile, That's, people who like work out every day do drop out at 50. Or as my father said, I buried 10. No, I buried 10 non-smokers. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Breslin, thank you so much for doing my podcast. You're I welcome, really appreciate Olivia. it. Um, I would say tell us where to find you, which is how they end every podcast, but I guess you don't want anyone to find you. You just come out to Yuck Yucks, right? You come out to Yuck Yucks, usually on a Friday night. I'm sitting in my booth. Come over, say hello. I love meeting people. I love talking to people. Um, anytime, you know. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome.